Good. So, resuming our classes here about Pavel Florensky, we're going to start today from page 39 from the second section that's titled The Appeal of a Wise Priest. So then, from what we have already seen about this biographical profile, I believe that we can already see that this is about, firstly, the manifestation of a great integrity and coherence of life and destiny. Okay, so ultimately of life and work. So this is one of the fundamental aspects that indeed make Pavel Florensky very appealing. This great integrity and coherence. An integrity and coherence manifested both in his life or the development of the course of his life and in the gradual elaboration of his own thought. And thus, from the fourth line, the text says, by reading his life and his work in isolation, we're given the impression that what we have is an unparalleled genius who has been able to unify the most uneven spheres of knowledge in a very rich, vital unity. The fields of mathematics and philosophy, of science and theology, of art and liturgy, of public professionalism and spirituality, of technical creativity, and of the priestly ministry. And so, Again, it's this integrity and coherence that characterize the figure of Pavel Florensky, both in his personal life and in his work. That's why the text has three lines below. We truly find ourselves before an author that amazes us in the quality of his thinking and the spiritual height of his conceptions. So, it's also worth highlighting that, in Florensky's case, as in the case of any great thinker, of excellence. What we will find is both quality and spiritual height. So, it is here then that we are able to understand one aspect in Pavel Florensky's project. To develop the greatest possible quality and also to keep or to encourage the maximum spiritual height. Precisely in this symbolic conception that allows us to contemplate these two aspects of the visible and the invisible under the same unity. And because of that, we can say, as it is mentioned somewhere in the text, this is a real author from Latin auctor, to augment, to make grow. And this is also, let's say, one of the essential features of the figure of Pavel Florensky. It's impossible to approach Pavel Florensky seriously and not grow. And personal growth is precisely one of the things that Florensky himself promotes, both in intellectual quality and in spiritual height. And so, we see how these two, these um, two faces also come together. On the one hand, in the intellectual quality, and in spiritual height. And this is precisely one of the main features that's contained in Pavel Florensky's work. Why? Because when approaching Pavel Florensky, it's impossible not to grow, right? Florensky makes the soul grow and the person in general, both in intellectual quality and in spiritual height. And this is precisely what we can call growth. And so, at the same time, this growth is, we should say, linked to two particular fields that we already mentioned last session. And on the one hand, it's wisdom, that would be the intellectual quality, and the spiritual height based on humility. So, it's interesting how Florensky makes us grow in an extraordinary way, both in intellectual quality and in spiritual height. He will be ultimately leading us through the extraordinary paths of wisdom, but likewise without losing sight of the fruitful paths of humility. Both wisdom and humility, humility and wisdom, make up then the two substantial poles of growth that Florensky is offering us precisely through his presence, both personal, as in his life, and um, theological, philosophical, scientific in his work. So we can say that this is one of the fundamental features of the appeal that we can find in the main figure of Pavel Florensky. Because it's actually true, we should say, that we can find other examples where there is great intellectual quality, but lacking a real spiritual height. 
And we can perhaps find this in some philosophers, right? We have intellectual quality, but we don't have spiritual height. And the other way around, there are also examples where we can somehow find spiritual height, but not necessarily intellectual quality. In Florensky, these two elements are fully combined. In such a way that, as it's mentioned in the two remaining lines of this paragraph, something that we need to acknowledge is that with him, with Pavel Florensky, the one who surrenders to his work will grow spiritually. So when one really surrenders to Pavel Florensky's work, one grows. You really fill yourself both with intellectual quality and with spiritual height. And here's another very attractive aspect to be highlighted. It's even necessary to grow personally just to be able to understand him. So, we could say that the growth that he's offering us requires, at the same time, personal maturity. And here's where these two aspects are comprised, right? These two aspects that are linked in a crucial way. The growth that he's offering us at the same time implies a correspondence, thus a personal maturity on our behalf, so that we can understand him even better. I remember that at one time Florensky said that it was good to be a little bit ahead of one's time, talking about intellectual quality and spiritual height. But he said, I think I went too far. I think I went over 50 years ahead. He said, I think it's gonna be at least 50 years or a little bit more before I'm beginning to be understood. And indeed, at least as of today, if we more or less do the math, we'll see that it's been 77 years. So after 77 years, we are starting to get closer to this luminous figure, this ecclesiastic titan, so that we can first get closer to this growth that he offers us, and also to correspond to this offering with our own personal maturity. Thus, with our own, yeah, with our own um, Christian growth. That's why, as it says on page 40, more or less six or seven lines into the text, indeed, we can consider Pavel Florensky as a teacher in thought. Okay, so in this sense, Pavel Florensky is presented as an authentic teacher. He's a true guide in the path of the soul's life, and he is also an excellent spiritual partner. And why is this? Because he is also a Batyushka a spiritual father with whom one may find the fundamental answers for the development of one's own life. And so, what we see is that, just like in many intellectuals of his generation, they were trying precisely to find a new religious awareness, okay? So, this new religious awareness that will be developing between these two factors Right? This new religious awareness is trying at the same time to make us be able to reintegrate the totality of what's real, thus the totality of creation. And this way also, for example, we look to, on the one hand, reconcile the traditional orthodox asceticism of withdrawal of the world, thus asceticism, with human creativity and the eros of the love of the earth. And here, we should say, one of the aspects that's worth highlighting is that this new religious awareness will try, first and foremost, to reunite the heavens and the earth. Heaven and earth found together precisely in a new religious awareness. And therefore, also, in a new stance in life, in this new love that's ultimately translated as holiness. Why? Because apparently, also, throughout the 19th century with the positivism that we talked about, it was considered that the path to Christianity had somehow been branched into two fields. Either the truly ascetic field, thus the ascetic or monastic path, that included a blunt separation from the world, or the abandonment of this kind of asceticism or monastic life, and thus to dedicate oneself to the worldly activities, let's say, that ordinary life requires. And hence it seemed as though Christian life had been branched 
in two at least apparently antithetical or opposed fields, Florensky shows us that this isn't the case, that these two factors, both monastic asceticism, hence intense spiritual life, and the commitment in the world, are both part of the same reality. And so, this heaven would be an intense spiritual life. Thus, authentic. And the earth within this new religious awareness indeed takes on as well a committed human life. Thus, a serious human life. If intense spiritual life here is manifested as the true and authentic spiritual life, the earth is here taken then as a committed human life and therefore true. This perhaps, in trying to build more bridges, we could try to find it as a first attempt through um, an extraordinary work by St. Francis de Sales titled Introduction to the Devout Life. If you read this work, which should be read by all of us, if you read the Introduction to the Devout Life, you'll see that indeed, when he writes to Philothea, or the soul who loves God, he says that he's writing this to address just any person. Doesn't matter if he's religious, a layman, married, a widow, a monk, family woman, or single or married person. This is, we could say, one of the announcements through St. Francis de Sales three centuries earlier, where we were being reminded that it's not about opposing or to have two fundamental aspects quarrel, but that it's about integrating them in one and the same personal reality. Why? Because each human person has an internal dimension, what we would call the interiority dimension. But it's also true, and not less clear, that he also has an external dimension, thus a dimension concerning a visible development, right? And so, the same, just like Florensky, has let himself be guided by the antinomical reality of what's been created, he acknowledges that man is also called to integrate these two aspects, both the internal and the external. In short, we could say, to keep a true life of prayer and therefore to take on also a true and genuine action in the world. So, on this side, with the intense spiritual life, thus authentic, is where prayer would be found. That would constitute the internal part of the human being. And on the other side, with this committed human life, we would find the action. And hence, this would no longer be the internal manifestation of human beings, but now their external manifestation. Okay? So it's visibly presented in the world. And so, one of the fundamental aspects that we ourselves today suffer from is the incoherence of these two dimensions. For example, there are people who have an external life, an action that's very rich, and we could also say dynamic, but who are completely lacking a true internal depth. And on the contrary, there are people who may truly have internal depth, but with a really scarce impact on the external. Why? Because they haven't been really integrated, right? So in this sense, they haven't been really integrated as persons. And perhaps here, we may recognize, as in the fundamental monastic tradition, one of the main, or St. Benedict's main motto, ora et labora, thus pray and work. Here, we would have St. Benedict's ora, and he's the father of monks, right, at least in the West, and who at the same time was inspired by the desert fathers who came from the East, here we would have this ora part, and so first to dedicate to man's internal part, and that later, this internal prayer, this authentic and intense spiritual life, is manifested or expressed in the labora, thus in the daily work, in all the external life that man will develop. That's why to Saint Benedict it was so fundamental 
that prayer in turn be joined in this sense by labor, by work. And to Saint Benedict, in this sense, this was the kind of work that was first manual, okay? Manual work that would help ultimately to keep the concentration in prayer and that would also involve in this same labora the daily living with the remaining brethren. Why? Because it could perhaps be a great temptation to suppose that I have an intense internal life but that I wish to avoid the external dimension or, briefly, that I am doing great with God, but poorly with men. Or the opposite, that I'm doing great with men, but poorly with God. And so, we see that to Florensky, this intense or authentic spiritual life, regarding this growth, it turns out that we need to have God in an authentic, listen, in authentic communion with us, in a living truth that indeed transfigures our most intimate reality. And therefore, in really carrying out this encounter, this friendship with God, then also take this profound dimension to this external action where we come into a daily contact and a close contact with man in such a way that this new religious awareness ultimately integrates a relationship with God and relationship with man intense internal life, authentic and intense spiritual life, and committed external action, the internal and the external integrated in a full way. And so, just like during a previous session, we talked about the integrity of the worldview, here too we can indeed see how Florensky already conceives man through a constant exercise of integration and placing in the first place, of course, heaven. Thus, God. So that after this fundamental prayer, this external action can emerge or sprout that will take us to embrace everything that's universally human. And so, we can now already see how this new religious awareness integrates the divine and the human within a same heart, right? Within the same fundamental reality of growth and therefore also of maturity. And from here, if we go to page 41, Florensky in the second line, by echoing intellectuality's best intuitions and listening to the signs of the times, always wanted to think of and with the church. And here's also the other fundamental aspect. This new religious awareness is in, listen, God and with, and this with is actually men, in the church. And so, Florensky sees this new religious awareness fully established, this new defined stance that is in and with the church, thus in God and with man in the church, the human divine, the theohumanity, as it was once named by Vladimir Soloviev, who is in fact one of the great inspirers of this new Russian spiritual renewal, and who was also a great inspiration for, or <clears throat> very influential for Dostoevsky and many other intellectuals, including Florensky and many others. And by the way, it's interesting to know, just as a small detail that we may add to this, that Vladimir Solovyov, by the end of his life, wrote a very interesting work titled The Justification of the Good, and um, to know that by the end of his life, he was heavily attacked by the evil one because of the great work that he was doing. Same thing that happened to Gogol some time before, uh -huh, through the development of his work. But this in and with is, let's say, a fundamental aspect in and with through a true conjunction. Hence, a conjunction that's not merely just about joining two separate things, but a conjunction that will ultimately will become a true communion.
a unity. In such a way that Florensky now recognizes that in the church, God is to be found, but also men. There's the visible, but also the invisible. And we need to learn to start growing with this demand that the church herself represents for us. And from here then, Florensky will ultimately write a book that's considered his chief work, titled The Pillar and Ground of the Truth. And it's this text that I told you about that's fortunately already been translated and into Spanish by Father Francisco José López Saiz, published by Sígueme, and in that the reading was promoted as in the case of Nikolai Lusky, who was Florensky's contemporary, with a definite return to the church. And hence the fundamental comprehension that there, in Florensky's work, in Florensky's figure, one can find the correct path leading back to the truth, and therefore also to life. Another one, for example, is Sergei Bulgakov. In fact, if you take a look, for example, in this text, this oil painting that we see here, the one in black is Bulgakov. Okay? He is Sergei Bulgakov. He was also a Russian Orthodox theologian, convert, just like Florensky. And, let's say, the interesting thing here, the interesting thing about this painting, is that if we look at it, and let's say if we try to pay a little bit of attention to these two figures, it's eye-catching to realize that in the background, the main thing we can distinguish is a forest that could be more or less a country symbolization of the Russian steppe, of these of these Russian forests found in green and that haven't been fully crushed by the Soviet regime. And so there's hope for life. But the fundamental thing is that both of them are somehow walking forward. And so they are both ultimately heading towards the future. Remember what we talked about at the end, right? Towards the future. So they are both heading that way. But they are not manifesting the same kind of attitude. If you pay attention to this, uh, this, to this beautiful painting, you will see that Sergei Bulgakov is depicted with a frowning face, as with a defiant look towards the future, to what's ahead, right? There's certain aggressiveness in the posture, and there's also a very subtle hint about the hand, as if it's ready to be thrusted into attack at any time. And so this would be some kind of attitude that's somehow expressing a decided stance, but not exempt of certain disturbance. All right? But it's different with Florensky. If you look at it, and this is what's extraordinary, Florensky's face is completely peaceful. Unlike Sergei Bulgakov's, who's looking fiercely at what's still ahead. And for that reason, he's not exempt from certain disturbance and discomfort. Florensky has his eyes practically shut, and with a certain countenance and posture resembling prayer, and with his head tilting down. What does it mean? That Sergei Bulgaka, for example, was still somehow considering that his mission to be carried out into the future was still in the hands of men, but not to Florensky. To Florensky, actually, what is still to come lies in the hands of God, and therefore it's possible to rest. I don't know if what I'm saying is clear. And so, the other fundamental detail is that we see how Florensky, who's wearing this traditional Orthodox outfit, now as a priest, unlike Sergei Bulgakov's hand, the one that is showing as if being ready to remove the cloak and launch into attack, Florensky's left hand is depicted touching his heart. And what could we say that all this actually means? First, that hence Florensky's hope does not rest on human capacity to face misfortune. And therefore, this eliminates all traces of violence. But rather, it rests on the living presence of God in one's heart, and thus placing all his hope and trust in the Creator of all things. So if you look at it, you could say that Florensky emanates peace, whereas Bulgakov emanates certain uneasiness. Besides, Florensky is holding a staff in his hand, certain of the path that he's traveling and in this sense precisely as a priest, acknowledging that everything that happens, regardless of how terrible it might seem, is ultimately 
hiding an invisible reality that should take us then to an exaltation of faith and also of hope and of charity. Well then, Bulgakov, the one in black, the defiant Bulgakov, is suggesting various things with regards to his friend's thought, his friend, um, Pavel. Page 42, third line says, that Florensky's thought, less than some other authors, cannot be separated from the depth of his own life, centered in priesthood, that gives a great religious quality to his work, and also a mystagogical character, in that we're surely running into one of those peaks in human thought, in which scientific and philosophical meditation, taken to its completion, has reached as well, and from within, the proper simplicity of true spirituality. And that Florensky's person, eminent example of Russian religious philosophy, can have an ecumenical importance, a first magnitude. In this ecumenical importance, a first magnitude, that Bulgakov had already detected, is also one of the features that we have really tried to highlight ever since the initial presentation of this course. Okay, to realize how Christ wants to make his all of the cultures, but that this project is through holiness. And so ecumenism, not as a relationship or a gathering of completely different positions, but rather the approach in one same spirit into this following of Christ in holiness. And also that ultimately this ecumenical importance of first magnitude and not only for the church's mutual knowledge and approach, but also for the birth of a new ecumenism in thought in the dawn of a new Christian millennium. And so this ecumenicity of thought means to actually retake authentic Catholicity. Thus, the, Catholic, the Catholicity that's capable of being launched into the universal, overcoming all divisions and all contradictions and all those irreconcilable antinomies that somehow frighten man and stop him from actually going beyond. Thus, to finally make our thought grow through an intense spiritual life and also through a committed human life. Thus, through being capable of reaching an intellectual quality and spiritual height that would be, in this sense, a personal Christian elevation. Personal Christian elevation. That's why I insisted already on various occasions on telling you that today's Christians cannot be um, outside of the game. Right, so he cannot be below the circumstances of our times. He has to take on the demands that these times um, are bringing forth and thus be up to the circumstances. And this being up to the circumstances implies, on the one hand, intellectual potential, and so to activate all our intellectual potentiality, but also to awake all our internal depth, thus to activate intellectual quality and spiritual height in service ultimately of the truth and therefore of eternal life. Okay? Now, on page 43, Florensky <clears throat> is now aware that in the beginning of the 20th century, a rupture of the times was illuminating a new epoch. And this is what our Saint Father Pavel is telling us. We are in a new epoch. The new epoch, the 21st century, this personal Christian elevation is necessary to face and defeat the new epoch. And this new epoch is precisely the 21st century. Thus, we are. This new epoch to Florensky invited us ultimately to have a new deep discernment about what was going on and therefore to be able to foresee 
what it was that we as Christians had to do about this situation. That's what it says at the beginning of the next quote. Florensky says, about what has happened to me, it's as if the fracture of the history of the world had been lived objectively. And so the first thing that Florensky detects is that in this new epic, a fracture has been presented. Something in particular has been fractured. And what is primarily what has been fractured? The integrity of life itself. And so, it would seem as though life has been split into pieces. It has been multiplied. It has been scattered into diverse fields that we often disguise under the excuse of specialization. For instance, as in the various fields of specialized knowledge. Okay? And so it would seem as though the specialization would take us to delve into one detail, the detail, scrupulous detail, but losing sight of the whole. To put it briefly, we could say, Florensky is here giving us a much more profound light. What is this fracture? The weakening. And we could even say, hum, the loss of strength and the breakdown of Catholicity itself. Because while the Catholicity looks for the integration of totality today in this world, we're actually invited to break with this totality so that everything is divided and broken down into thousands of different scattered fragments. And what therefore is being encouraged instead of communion, thus instead of unity, is what Charles Taylor has accurately defined as disengagement. And so, there's where we can actually find this fracture. And Florensky now says, It suddenly became clear to me that time has crashed. Thus, that it would seem as though time is no longer featuring a continuity, but rather, it now appears as some sort of disruption, a rupture with regard to everything that came before, and ultimately an announcement of an uncertain progress in which it's not clear where it will take us. Where are we then heading? I don't remember very well now if it was Paul Claudel who said, it's as if we had been told, as if we all had been told, get on the train at full speed, but we were never told where it was going. As if being part of this rupture and then getting on the train at full speed, but without actually knowing where we were heading. And he says, and that consequently, something very important has come to an end that didn't just concern me, but all the history of humanity as well. And so, this facing and defeating the new epic of the 21st century involves all humanity. And here we see how one of Florensky's fundamental intuitions is to take back this new religious awareness that allows us to realize that everything that we do has an impact for better or for worse on everyone else, one way or another. Whereas, for example, the false illusion of the modern world had ultimately led us to what we could call the privatization of existence itself. And what is this privatization of existence? To suppose that I, here in the world, am only called to develop my life only according to my own plans and according to my own judgment, and therefore to lose sight of the fundamental relevance that my life has with regard to others. This is precisely what we could call the privatization of existence, that, as we already know, the intellectuals of the second half of the 20th century, and also of today, the 21st century, insist so much on recovering, and I mean that they insist on recovering this human awareness, and therefore not to deprive men of their authentic social dimension, and that is to say of their authentic communal dimension. And so, as we can see, Florensky already, by listening to the science of the times, realizes that what's in danger is the entire humanity, it's no longer about just one town being in danger, as in this case his hometown, Russia, or as it happened in the, in the 1960s after the Soviet Union's invasion to Eastern European countries that were ultimately submitted to the communist regime, but that beyond these reachable regional dangers 
the whole humanity has been put in danger. Why? Because to face and to defeat the new epoch, thus the 21st century, that involves all humanity, is to overcome the disengagement. A disengagement that has particular history. On the one hand, the modern idea of autonomy, this modern invention, and, on the other hand, the miscomprehension of human reality itself by, for example, reducing human existence or else to an entirely biologistic version thus as just a natural organism among others or else to a mere rationalism that would apparently lose sight of the direct contact that we have with regard to others. That's why Florensky says it's about the sensation, whether mortal nostalgia, sharp pain, or unbearable torment of conscience, that produces the demolition of what has been constructed with great effort. And when I say this, I don't think so much of my own commitment, but of the efforts in general, the European. But in this terrible pain, that could almost make one scream, the beginning of the liberation and the resurrection could be felt. Not only for me, but a common resurrection. And so, Florensky, unlike Bulgakov, as we saw, if you remember, in this pictorial sense, not only gives in to the painful vision, the fracture, the wound that's found in the world, but he also intuits that, above or behind the same wound, a profound announcement of liberation can also be found, or in this sense, as he calls it, of resurrection, and that he didn't only mean it about himself, but in common. And so it's ultimately like seeing um, a terrifying storm cloud, but at the same time realizing that it's only that, a storm cloud, that the sun is still shining with the same strength, and that sooner or later this storm cloud will have to vanish. And that's what actually allows Florensky to keep his serenity. And that's why if we take a look at the beginning of the next paragraph, in the fourth line, we see how Florensky then understands his own vital task as the tracing of the paths to a future integral worldview. And so this future integral worldview, that's nothing more than an authentic Catholic stance. And thus something like a living totality which is the core around which all his works revolve, whether scientific in nature, or theological, or philosophical, or history of the culture, and we could also add linguistic, musical, poetic, of translation, um, of literature. And to Father Pavel, it is the last objective in the effort of his entire existence. And so look at it. Florensky, by overcoming the disengagement, does not give in to the, let's say, terribly difficult moments that history is going through, but that he also goes himself through the hardness of the time. He goes through this dense and loaded storm cloud to ultimately be able to distinguish what's coming from there to here. Ultimately, there's a renewal. There is a spiritual rebirth even if this, let's say, implies a profound, general purification. To a great extent, this very drastic situation that happened in Russia is somehow what's happening today in our globalized world. It would also seem like, one way or another, we are going through a period where, as it would be once announced by Martin Buber, it would seem as if there had been an eclipse of God. It's not that God has disappeared, it's more as if he had been eclipsed, as if he weren't there, as if he weren't, in this sense, accessible to us. And it's here where the reactions on this matter are shown. They are almost always polarized. The first one, to give in to total discouragement, right? This world is a waste and it's just getting worse and worse and then to frown upon it and to take it as a challenge, or better yet, as a total defeat. Or else, to go directly to the optimist's team, right? And so, to say that no, it's not true, everything is fine, everything's wonderful, no worries, and so ultimately innovation of the particular situation. 
And so, to Florensky, to overcome the disengagement, one should not be confused with a false or illusory attempt of evasion, either on the negative side or on the positive side. But rather, to overcome the disengagement means to go through it. And to go through it in this sense is then also to dismantle it. To go to the roots. To go through it is to go to the roots. It's like when one tries, for example, to reach, let's say, a ball that has gone onto um, a field that's perhaps full of thorns. And thus, when trying to reach it, you will be scratched or you will be somehow wounded and it will not be very comfortable. But the objective is clear. One, not to be afraid. And two, not to give in or surrender. Do not surrender before this that is brutally trying to impose itself. In other words, not to be praise of deception. Mm -hmm. Not to be afraid. Perhaps this could be understood a little bit better today if we go to our contemporary social reality. For example, many believe that the world is so corrupted that it's totally impossible to change it. And many people have this conviction. They would tell you, now you know the system is already so perfect that no matter what you do, you cannot change absolutely anything. Well, that's one same psychological strategy of this environment. And why? To lead us into discouragement. So, in this sense, we see how, in order to really get to the roots, we need to be well equipped. We need, therefore, to go carrying the right equipment. One intellectual quality so that we're not naive and hence inappropriate and spiritual height so we don't surrender so Florensky our father here is preparing his children hence us to undertake this great combat in which the entire humanity is at stake it's not about then of a mere action and let me insist traceable reduced marginal and bordered but rather of a real Catholic commitment. And so, again, we Catholics need today both fundamental equipments to go to the roots of the contemporary world. One, great intellectual quality, so that we're not praise of naivete and therefore turn out to be inappropriate. And two, a great spiritual height, so that we don't surrender in the journey so that we're not defeated beforehand because the combat is in this sense very serious and from here it's that Florensky then on page 44 begins to trace the mysterious depth of life right this mysterious depth of life and it is where this new religious awareness will ultimately lead him to to the mysterious unity of life this getting to the bottom, reaching the bottom. Not to stay on the superficial, but not to remain either too entertained about the particular details that can be found in the various situations. This would be as if you were invited to explore a forest, a beautiful and leafy forest filled with various features, but that you when coming in would only stay examining a little leaf in thorough detail you would be missing everything else in this effort of comprehension and engagement. So, not to stay dazzled at first with details, and second, not to lose sight of the main objective, to go to the bottom, thus to address the questions in all their complexity, no matter how hard this task turns out to be, no matter how, even exhausting because it is, that this task can turn out to be. And so, within this new impetus that Florensky transmits us, there is no room for mediocrity. This is about a great elevation of a great personal Christian elevation. That's the only thing that can help us to face and defeat the new epic. Thus, 
This 21st century, that at least as of to date, has seen 13 years and that's still moving forward. And so we too must go through it without fear whatsoever. In such a way that in the memories that he dedicates to his children, there we can find um, um, a bigger development of these fundamental intuitions that Florensky had. On page 44, in the first paragraph and five lines before the end of the text, it says, The worth of this text, thus his memories, right, dedicated to his children, is found in the fact that it gathers the pre-philosophical experiences of the young Pavel, articulating them in what could very well be considered a manifesto of the fundamental ideas of the future works of our author. And what we see is that, indeed, all these developments that will reach their adequate formulation only in Florensky's maturity are beginning to beat, right? Or to be, or, or to be announced, rather, as a fundamental announcement in these pre-philosophical intuitions. And so kind of childlike by Florensky. For example, at the beginning of the next paragraph, the text says, One thing is revealed to us with clarity. Pavel Florensky's worldview is rooted in his childhood experience. It is contained in the maturity of his own vital paths. And so here, as we can see, childhood plays a fundamental role. Why? Because childhood is the most susceptible stage not to separate oneself from totality. During childhood, what hasn't been manifested yet or hasn't been developed in a clear way is this eagerness for specialization and thus division. The child, to put it briefly, is always open to what happens. That's why the child finds everything amazing. That's why everything is incredible for a child. Right? Everything amazes him. And everything amazes him because the child is not yet trapped in himself. He hasn't reversed things yet to now place his own perception of the world at the center of everything. Plain and simply, the world that surrounds him, that's what's extraordinary. Or, if we try to put it in a little bit more philosophical terms, the child is indeed immersed in pure objectivity. He will later have to learn what it means to indeed take on a subjectivity. But for the child, there is no I, or an I that's the center of everything. For the child, there's a whole. And this whole is precisely what surrounds him. Huh? The most beautiful example of this would be the following. When a child is very small and you're playing with him, he covers his eyes and he just assumes that nobody sees him. Huh? Even if you're in front of him. Nope. And why? Because for him, ultimately, this hole that surrounds him is somehow still making it hard for him to distinguish between the self and not-self. The child is just a simple spirit. Simple does not mean, as we mistakenly understand it today, something like low or mediocre. No, it's a spirit that's free from unnecessary complications. That's why these memories that he dedicates to his children Father Pavel here will talk about the person's process of spiritual maturation. So, what we see is that all this that we have mentioned, precisely this growth, does not mean that we have to achieve it by pulling our hair, right? But what it means is that this growth is one that ultimately appeals to a process. And this process is also heavily linked to each and everyone's personal reality. Or to put it differently, not everyone has the same rhythm. Not everybody has the same tempo, to use this musical term. There's a specific rhythm for every single thing. For example, an animal's growth is not the same as a plant's growth. Even among animals, there's a lot of variation, right? And among human beings. Even among ourselves, as human beings, this process, right, or this process of growth, implies a particular rhythm. And here it would be worth issuing a couple of warnings. The first one. Do not believe 
that because we didn't get the desired results, immediately it means that we're failing. Mm -hmm. Let's suppose I set out to stop watching pornography or not to lie or not to deceit and then I couldn't make it. And so then, oh man, that means I'm failing. No, we have to focus on the process because this process comes from deep inside and goes all the way out. Is that clear? In such a way that we cannot simply assess it beforehand based on the obtained results but based on the acquired perseverance. And so, this growth of spiritual maturity depends primarily on perseverance, not on the results. Because when we want to accelerate the process, we'll be making a great mistake. For example, I just quit right away and apparently stop watching pornography. And yes, I don't watch it, but I'm thinking of pornography all the time. And so this means that I'm really not in growth. I'm not in this sense in maturation. And so concerning all this that will be explained to us precisely by Father Pavel, and he says that this process is a process in which one will fall. But there are also resurrections. And so there's defeat. That's true. But there's also triumph. There's progress and sometimes falls. And then you fall again, but then you go forward again. And why? Because spiritual life is not linear as in what's usually found in mechanical progress that we're so much used to from point A to point B. Spiritual life depends first and foremost on the height that has been reached and the acquired intensity. It's not like going from one point to another. This is just some kind of analogical reference, like an analogy, so we can have a better understanding of what this is about. But it's fundamental for us to recognize our human reality. And therefore, we do not get disencouraged about our own weaknesses, nor about our own impossibilities to achieve sometimes what we set out to. What's fundamental is to recognize these faults and resurrections and we realize that just as Florensky indeed clearly mentions this process of faults and resurrections is called conversion and so conversion is not about simply oh yeah I met with God and yeah everything's fine everything's perfect so now we're leaving no it means that we have to go through and thus to transfigure our own human reality and this will ultimately involve a constant struggle. And that's why Florensky says in the next quote on page 45. First, he says, How is the crystallization of anemic processes produced? What are the anemic processes? They are precisely the internal processes of the human soul. And he says, how are they crystallized? Notice here the height, right, that Florensky has already achieved. He says the soul's life is formed very early, before we're even able to understand. Childhood is entirely personal. There is nothing empty in it. Everything is interesting and is filled with a deep sense. The child is capable of wonder, of stepping out of himself. And that's why Florensky says he's a philosopher. And so, see how Florensky has here finally given us the golden key. The key that allows us to, just like in the wonderful stories by George MacDonald, access the world of the invisible. By the way, George MacDonald has a story titled The Golden Key. And Florensky gives us just that mysterious golden key, taking us through unprecedented paths that helps us go through the threshold that connects us directly with the other world. Stepping out of oneself, that is the conversion. And we'll see that this is why everything is interesting for the child, because he's in a complete state of ecstasy. Ecstasy means to step out of oneself. The life of a child is a continuous ecstasy. He's not yet trapped in the harsh nets, okay? 
of his own subjectivity. He hasn't turned yet, so to say, to self-awareness, self-consciousness or self-perfection. <clears throat> or, ultimately, to self-knowledge. In short, for the child, the self is not yet fully awake. It hasn't fully appeared yet. That's why everything's interesting. Right? If you hold a child and say to him, I'll toss you to the moon, the child will say yes and he'll be excited. Everything's interesting. If you hold a grown-up and say, I'll toss you to the moon, he'll probably say you're quite dumb. And why? Because the grown-up already dominates the self. And so, to Florensky it's clear that this conversion ultimately means to step out of oneself. Exist. Right? To live in this continuous ecstasy that frees me from myself. And therefore, the child is not in need yet of beginning to die to himself. This that he ultimately attached himself to. That's why he says, only certain fundamental intuitions obtain, and everything else grows upon them, that crystallizes around these seeds. That's why Florensky says, in childhood, we see things that reveal the other world. And so we could say, why is it that in childhood we see things that reveal the other world? Quite simple. Because there's still not yet an I that opposes that world. There's still no subjective stance that denies the reality of that other world. Is this clear? Everything is, plain and simply, transparent. There's still no I yet to oppose that other world. And who wants to even challenge that world by saying, I am the author of the world. My thought is the creator of this world. Or my sensitive faculties, as the empiricist would have it, is what allows me to conform with the later aid of my reason. All the existing world. Simply put, we could say, the child hasn't yet been obstructed by this I, thus by the ego. In this sense, the child has no ego. This ego hasn't been developed yet. This possibility in him is not yet awake. That's why what Florensky says now about conversion is the following. He says, how do you change your life? Remember, he's writing this to his children. That's what he dedicates in his memories to his children. How do you change your life? And Florensky answers, It's done through a rupture in the development of any anemic process. When something happens all of a sudden, a mystical experience is revealed. What used to be only an abstract concept is now understood with clarity. What used to be a mere theory. Something happens and all of a sudden a new world is open unlike anything else. That contact with the other world is a discontinuous return to childhood. It's not to say in general terms that thoughts acquire a new quality, but they are now linked to the root of childhood. And he says, every experience of conversion renews the juvenile structure of the soul. So, what we perceive is that this conversion is precisely what allows us to renew the juvenile structure of the soul. Thus, this juvenile structure of the soul that precisely corresponds to a full freedom why to full freedom? Because this juvenile structure of the soul is still not prey of the ego that wants to devour everything. With that blunt denial that will eventually get in conflict with that other world. Let's remember, or better, let's anticipate that. To Florensky, ultimately, everything will be defined in one single disjunctive. Either him or me. Thus, either God or me. And this is precisely where this conflict would come in. And so, this full freedom means absence of self-centered conflicts.
And therefore, this absence of self-centered conflicts takes us also to realize the deep message given by Jesus when he said, unless you change and become like little children. What does this mean? If you don't really become like this child who is free, if you lack the absence of these self-centered conflicts that are only causing you a continuous block of the other world and therefore the denial of the truth, because the one who denies the truth is the one who affirms himself, right? When somebody says, truth doesn't exist, what he actually says is that only what I say is acceptable. Mm -hmm. I am opposed. And so in the child, this absence of self-centered conflicts takes him also to be free from suffering from the opposition. The opposition between the I and the objective world. In the child, this fundamental conflict between subjectivity and objectivity hasn't started yet. It hasn't really appeared in him yet. And this is why the child is the most real and clear example of this new religious awareness. In brief terms, precisely because of the absence of these self-centered conflicts, the child does exist, thus lives outside of himself. And therefore, the life of the child, so the juvenile structure of the soul, is a continuous ecstasy. And this ecstasy is to step out of oneself to get in contact with the truth, thus with the other world that reveals itself to a soul that's free from itself. Good so far? So if we look at it, for example, to Florensky, it was fundamental to return to the juvenile structure of the soul. And the most obvious reason is very simple, because that's the way we started out. That's the way we started. And when we were like that, like that, fully immersed in this juvenile structure of the soul, our freedom was full because we had an absence of self-centered conflicts and therefore we truly existed living outside of ourselves stepping outside of ourselves to be in continuous contact with the truth and therefore with life now it's here that we will see that to Florensky the fundamental point of this growth is precisely the renewal of the juvenile structure of the soul. It's curious, and here we see another antinomy. It would seem that Florensky is taking us to acquire a grown-up's intellectual quality, to give it a name, and a grown-up's spiritual height, but that actually corresponds to the juvenile structure of the soul. So, he wants us to go back, to return to this human state of communion with the truth and therefore with God right to say before this adult emancipation before interior to the human self-affirmation before the moment of challenge or rebellion in the human soul that says to God not you I it's only I it's a little bit like the teenager when he revolts isn't it he wants to have his own life. Don't stand in my way. I'm old enough. Huh? Give me my share of the inheritance so I can go to Las Vegas. <laughs> right, yeah, I'll go. Yeah, right, mind your own business. I don't listen, I don't see, I don't care. It's my life. And so there is this fundamental moment that every one of us will have to go through. We could say that this is the trial of self-confirmation. And this is fundamental. Why? Because our self-confirmation is at the same time a path to withdrawal. Withdrawal from this mistaken stance. And therefore, the return to the fundamental path of our lives. Conversion. The word conversion from conversio means to go back to the initial path. That's conversion. To go back to the initial path. And our initial path is precisely the authentic path of the existence of living outside of oneself to be free to contemplate the truth and therefore to get into communion with it 
Take a look at what he writes in a letter from from the Gulag to his daughter Olga. It's note 27 on this same page, 45, three lines into the text. That's the letter. And there he says to his daughter, the secret of creativity is to preserve youth. The secret of the genius is to preserve childhood. The juvenile constitution throughout the entire life. Listen, the entire life in this constitution, it's this constitution what gives the genius an objective perception of the world. And that's what's fundamental. Existence, therefore, corresponds to an objective perception of the world. One which, by not being centripetal, thus um, taken to the center of oneself, presents some kind of inverse perspective of the world, and that's why it's integral and real. The illusionist perspective, regardless of how bright and attractive it is, will never be seen as one of a genius, because the heart of the genius perception of the world is to penetrate in the deepest of things, whereas the essence of the illusory consists of shutting oneself to be protected from reality. And so here we see a central aspect. For the child, for the juvenile structure of the soul, reality is no threat whatsoever. It's not something threatening to devour or crush him. It's simply his natural habitat, his most immediate habitat, thus the objective perception of the world. So to Florensky, the real geniuses are the ones who are able to keep the juvenile structure of their souls throughout their entire lives and do not remain embroiled in those labyrinths, right? In, um, in, the, um, in the adult turmoil that are sometimes, even to us, utterly inaccessible. And now he also says following this, the most typical geniuses are Mozart, Faraday and Pushkin, whom, with regard to their internal structure, they are like children, with all the values and insufficiencies of this juvenile state. And this is what I told you about. It means that thus, this new religious awareness and the conversion process entail that we too will have these same insufficiencies, but that we will have enough spiritual height, thus, enough humility, so that we do not feel hurt by this. Because when one feels deeply hurt by one's own weaknesses, it's due to an excess of pride. Because pride makes things disproportionate and makes us see the small as an enormous thing. And no, the child, for example, has a lot of insufficiencies. Insufficiencies even in motion, in language. And he's not apologizing all the time, is he? No. He is simply not concentrating on himself, right? He is sinking his teeth in the objectivity with his objective perception of the world. And now, Florensky says, you don't understand what your father feels, who would love his children to be not only unimpeachable, but that they would represent even bigger values. Not for the others, but for yourselves you have to be like that. Because it doesn't matter what others will think of you. To be and not to pretend. And here, indeed, it seems like Florensky is offering us another fundamental key. The child simply is. And in our case, as we start to lose the juvenile structure of the soul, we start now to walk the path of pretending. We ourselves finally start to stop being, to become a mere appearance, without grounding and without foundation. And Florensky says, to have a clear and transparent mood, an integral perception of the world, and to cultivate a disinterested thought, aiming to reach an old age, one can say that all that's best has been achieved in life. The most worthy and beautiful has been assimilated from the world and that conscience has not been stained with filthiness to which people are so much attached, and that after the passion has passed, what remains as a leftover is a profound disgust.
And here's where we could try to go even, to delve deeper into this last point that Florensky has talked about, relying precisely on the following. First, the distinction between imagination and fantasy. For example, this great writer, George MacDonald, who's the great teacher and inspirer of people like Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, or C.S. Lewis, who wrote Narnia, even Chesterton and some others. He, for example, said that recovering the image was fundamental. Why? Because the image is nothing more than the emergence of objectivity that remains stamped on me. In other words, the image is not my invention. It's what I receive, something external that's given to me. That's the image. And so, what does the image ultimately encourage? Imagination, right? So, so true imagination is nothing more than the substantial usage of all the received images. Thus, imagination recovers the profound fecundity that the image is giving us. Okay? So what's the opposite of imagination? Fantasy. To George MacDonald, who was an extraordinary writer, also unjustly forgotten and practically unknown in Spanish, but I think that a collection of short stories has been released by Atalanta, if I'm not mistaken. And that's the last thing I saw. Anyway, to George MacDonald, one of the central aspects was that we had confused things. We had them all mixed up. For example, he would say that he was a writer of the imagination, right? That he was literally only looking to recover the image's richness. But to recover the image's richness, or so to transmit the inexhaustible fecundity of objectivity, it was necessary to renounce subjectivity, thus fantasy. And so, MacDonald, for example, made this contrast, saying that actually fantasy is nothing more than the invention, yeah, the invention of ghosts by men that don't correspond to reality. That's why, to George MacDonald, and this is an aspect that perhaps today we have forgotten, the fanciful as when you would say to someone, you're fantasizing, it had to do more with the unreal. Okay, and that's why we talked about a fanciful person. For example, Avatar, right, and all of these fantasy proposals that we are being offered today, and that to us, they may seem so seductive and even suggestive because they indeed match quite well with our own fantasies. Thus, fantasy is nothing more than our own inventions, right? The ghosts that we have and we are attached to. For its part, imagination is nothing more than the usage of the immense richness of objective reality, of truth. And that's why, too, Florensky, the same as to MacDonald, for example, George MacDonald, the recovery of the image was fundamental and not to stay stuck in our own fantasies. I think we could give now um, a very particular example of what we're talking about. What happens when we, without objectivity, start to give in to the pressure that our own thoughts are instilling in us? An example, my wife or my husband said that he or she would call at some time, and after two hours they haven't called. In general, what we start doing is to fantasize. Oh no, what could have happened? Maybe he crashed, or maybe she's in the hospital. And this fantasy is ultimately only leading us to madness. But imagination instead, which is to say the fertile usage of the image that is not ours, but that we receive so we can bear fruit, does not lead to madness, but to creativity. And so, to Pavel Florensky, it was quite clear that imagination was the fundamental path to creativity, whereas fantasy was the particular path to insanity, and in this sense, to madness. And therefore also, and regarding this, Florensky will say that we must always aim to that which is higher.
to accept what has been given to us, and therefore to renounce our false role of producers, or even worse, of self-producers, of everything that exists. And so, to set aside the fantasy, and to recover, in this sense, the imagination. That's why he says at the beginning of the... Or no, just right below. And that is in the last three lines before the end of this paragraph on page 46, that this is what the profound experience of being consists in. And so, for example, we could say, what is ultimately what encourages fantasy? That the profound experience of being be nullified, because fantasy that promotes the annulment of the profound experience of being precisely rejects the being in favor of self-produced ghosts of ghosts that are ultimately self-generated. And it would seem as though we're satisfied with our own caricatures that is similar to what happens today with animated cartoons. Hmm? If you follow this line of reasoning, you'll realize what I'm talking about. Right? The substitution. But instead, with imagination, that's not what happens. Why? Because in the case of imagination, what we can see is that through this imagination, we're able to actually recover this profound experience of being. Why? Because to Florensky, it's very important in this sense to direct our attention to the unusual, but in what's known. So the exception of what's daily, the bonus of reality and mystery in every phenomenon. A bonus, a beyond, that's laden there. That is, let's say, present. But this presence is not immediate. And it's also not directly accessible. But which doesn't mean that therefore it's less real. Let me read you an example from this text that I'm reading. But that suits perfectly. Oops. And it's by Charles Taylor that we're now studying thoroughly from this text titled A Secular Age, the latest novelty by Taylor translated into Spanish, just released, still smells like new, just been printed. But I would like you to see where this, um, this profound experience of being is heading to. And this is an example taken from Charles Taylor's work, A Secular Age, first volume, from Beat Griffith's autobiography. And let's see what it says. One day, during my last term at school, I walked out alone in the evening. Hmm? Normal. And heard the birds singing in that full chorus of song, which can only be heard at that time of the year, at dawn or at sunset. I remember now the shock of surprise with which the sound broke on my ears. And so what do we have here? He goes out for a walk, just as he's done it many other times. Okay? And here, he will have this bonus of reality, this mystery of the phenomenon, this unusual in the known. And he is surprised by this shock. He said, It seemed to me that I had never heard the birds singing before. And I wondered whether they sang like this all year round, and I had never noticed it. What does it mean? That it seems that, that he had somehow set this objectivity aside, he says. As I walked, I came upon some hawthorn trees in full bloom, and again I thought that I had never seen such a sight, or experienced such sweetness before. And so take a look at it. It's not only through hearing, now it's also something that's been manifested through sight. And he says, If I had been brought suddenly among the trees of the Garden of Paradise, and heard a choir of angels singing, I could not have been more surprised. So, see what he says? Even if I had been put before angels, the surprise that I was having at that time, the shock, the profound experience of being, would not have been bigger. The mystery, we could say, had been revealed to him. He says, I came then to where the sun was setting, over the playing fields. A lark rose suddenly from the ground beside the tree where I was standing, and poured out its sung above my head, and then sank still singing to rest. 
Everything then grew still as the sunset faded and the veil of the dusk began to cover the earth. I remember now the feeling of awe which came over me. I felt inclined to kneel on the ground, as though I had been standing in the presence of an angel, and I hardly dared to look on the face of the sky, because it seemed as though it was but a veil before the face of God. This is the profound experience of being. And we're talking about some memories that Bede Griffiths is narrating in his autobiography. And that's it. This is the profound experience of being. The revelation of the mystery. The uncover to remove that veil that covers the face of God. And that this veil is nothing more than creation itself. Precisely through its visible manifestation. And so we can see how this that Florensky is mentioning is not something strange to many people, right? This profound experience of being. I don't know if you have actually lived or experienced this in ordinary situations in life. It once happened to me with the crowing of a rooster. And it was just the rooster crowing. I noticed how strange it was. I don't know, it was just strange. It was something more than just that rooster. It was a sound appealing to something else. It was like, I don't know, let's say, like discovering a new world. And that's why to the child, this juvenile structure of the soul, or as in juvenile structure of the soul, everything appears unveiled. There isn't, um, let's say, a fundamental barrier interrupting the actual access to this mystery. The same as Griffiths, right, as we just read, See what Florensky says at the beginning of the last quote on page 46. All the singular, everything that's unusual, was being represented to me as if it were a message from the other world. And that fixed my thought, or better, my imagination. You see? What does it mean? That imagination in this sense, when it's really seized upon as such, it's the reception of everything that images transmit to us, trying actually to reveal to us the mystery of being, and therefore trying to produce this profound experience in all of us. But, let's say, what can alter or block or even deviate our imagination the most is thought. Because, for example, in thought, what we do is to take the initiative Right? When we start thinking, in a certain way, it's now we. We're the ones taking the initiative. And this is the way in which, therefore, a particular block will be initiated. And so in the last five lines, Florensky says, Furthermore, there were few things that weren't surprising and singular. And many of the things that adults disregard with indifference were the ones affecting my reason and were being printed on me as an originary image. And here's where we see indeed how, to Florensky, this fundamental image is a real impression. Clear? In both ways, or should I say, in both senses of the word, it's an impression, something that remains printed on the soul, but that also puts pressure on the same soul. It's something that will remain printed out. It's something that gets attached to the soul and that will be, in this sense, a true commotion. And thus, the experience of the symbol. The experience of the symbol is precisely the profound experience of being. By the way, let me recommend a book by Victoria Sirlot. She's a contemporary Spanish philosopher, still alive, titled The Internal Vision. And there she shows how this vision, and there she draws a very interesting contrast between the medieval vision, which is primarily objective, and the modern vision, which is primarily subjective. And so she says before, when we talked about vision, for example, she uses images of St. Hildegard of Bingen. And so she says before, what we had was an effort to try to represent the viewed image, right? and the difficulties that in this case the one who transmits it will find will show up because this is not a human product. And so, in this sense, imagination 
grasps what is given to it. Whereas, for example, she'll say in Surrealism, in doing this very interesting study, and you who like aesthetics very much, this is a very short book, but it's very good, says if we take a look at some surreal paintings, we will see that indeed, it would seem as though imagination is being set aside to make way somehow for fantasy, right? If one stayed on a mere superficial level. But nonetheless, what also in this sense surrealism will try to manifest is this fundamental image that would be beyond our conscious distortion. Remember now that the Surrealists were heavily influenced by Freud, and so the perception of another world. And so the fundamental difference, Victoria Sirlot will say in this sense, is that both recognize that there is another world. But, however, the difference is, as in the case of medievals, the other world is of a spiritual nature theological, divine. To the Surrealists, this other world is inserted on the inside of men. In this unconscious chaos where, when we want to translate this dreamlike, surreal world, this profound world, we will ultimately find the difficulties of actually being able of transmitting the message, right? And so here we could say that we would find a very interesting contrast. And finally, what we see at the beginning of the next paragraph of page 47 is that indeed this is the experience of astonishment before being, out of which all philosophical questions are born, and that already makes a philosopher of the child. Mm -hmm. What actually makes a child be a philosopher? And to Florensky, one of the aspects that will turn out to be fundamental is precisely hmm, this lived experience of astonishment before being. Thus, the pre-philosophical experiences of life and these lived experiences, this astonishment before being, which is pre-philosophical, will be largely translated in what we could call the world before knowledge which is precisely a little bit now because of the complexity of what we will be talking next class. Alright? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.